as the nation celebrates its 61st birthday, it's increasingly and depressingly clear that Nigeria is becoming two different countries, the North and the South, with little in shared identity. The cleavages in Nigeria society have become so extreme and no recent issue better exemplifies this phenomenon than the growing spread of insecurity, kidnappings, killings, insurgency, banditry, and extreme poverty, economic woes, just to mention a few of the myriads of issues confronting us as a nation. On the anniversary of our independence, Nigeria is less a country united and far more a house divided. For many Nigerians, the holiday is a painful reminder of all Nigeria theocratic rulers stole from them. With us today on Sahara TV's special Independence Day coverage is Dele Farutinu, a legal practitioner, a political activist, and a political affairs analyst on the lies we tell ourselves every Independence Day. Dele Farutinu, welcome to Sahara TV. Thank you for having me. Let me start by asking you, what does October 1st mean to you? Before I answer that question, there was something you said in the introduction that I need, must deal with quickly. And that is the North-South divide. And I'm going to put that in quote. Our kleptocratic ruiners would prefer that we shape the discourse in those terms. But the reality is that those terms would be somewhat misleading, even though the facts that they will play up will tend to suggest that there is indeed a north-south divide. So it is an issue that we need to come back to at some point in our discourse, because a lot of fallacies are hidden in that phrase. Um, what does the independence they mean? Well, as I was saying yesterday to some friends, Nigeria is not a country that has managed to produce citizens. And in the absence of citizens, we have been robbed of patriots because it is only citizens who transit to become patriots. But because Nigeria does not have room for equal citizenship, it is not ruled by law, but by the imperatives of men and their prerogatives. What it has meant is that in place of a nation or even a country, we have an amoral state that is by far more powerful than the sum total of the people within its territory. So Nigeria is that anomalous state that does not have citizens because it is not governed by law. And its birthday is to be mourned, not to be celebrated. He's 61 years old. He's older than I am. But in his entire history, at least in my lifetime, it has never given me any reason to be proud because it has never afforded me citizenship. So there is nothing to celebrate, absolutely nothing. How about the words freedom? Freedom. I mean, what does freedom mean? What does liberation mean? The first condition of freedom is self-determination, the capacity to determine the course of my life. When the theory of state was propounded, it said that men living in the state of nature came together in recognition of the brutish and nasty nature of the state in which they were living. And they thereby donated their rights to the state. They created an entity larger than themselves. And that state is usually governed by rules, by laws. Every modern state evolved from the rights of citizens being donated to create governance. The Magna Carta dates back to 12 something, maybe about 12, I can't, I can't remember now, but that's the 13th century. 
the Nigerian constitution, the first one, dates back only, what, 1960s. So when you begin to see the disparity in the number of years by which the states in modern Europe and everywhere evolved, you'll find that the rights of citizens were first established, and it was citizens who established states. The sovereigns became subject to law. But in Africa, because we are a creation of the white man's fantasy, we were created for the white man's convenience, his economic stratagem. Those were the foundation for the creation of African states. Some people sat down between themselves at a table in Berlin and they drew lines and they created countries. Unfortunately, even when they exited, they created conditions that have made it impossible for citizenship to emerge in those places. So in a place like Nigeria, for instance, you find that the basis for the creation of the Nigerian state were tribal associations who were cobbled together at independence, represented by those we call founding fathers. You then find very quickly that even the history of the Bill of Rights that you find enshrined in the 1960 constitution came out of the agitation of the minorities who were worried about the protection of their rights trapped between the three behemoths who were the regions at independence in 1960. So you find very quickly that rights in Nigeria have not evolved as a function of citizenship. They have emerged as a function of tribal fears for domination. And that tells you the way the state in Nigeria views rights. So when they give a Yoruba, when they make a Yoruba man the president, they believe that that should silence me as a Yoruba man, and I therefore have lost the right to complain about the inequities of the Nigerian state because my right as a citizen has been aggregated and subsumed behind the group identity. So you find that in Nigeria, when we talk about the concept of freedom, when we talk about the concept of right, it actually has completely different connotation from the intentions of those who own those words. But let me quickly get yes. this clarification. Because I mean, quite a number of people will disagree with you concerning, concerning the fact I'm that, used to that our founding fathers actually fought for the liberation. What did they fight for? I mean, these were no, the tenants. You, you see, the the greatest problem of the black man, not just Nigeria. They deserve to refer to themselves as big patriots. No, don't worry. The people call themselves different names in Nigeria. Obasanjo will tell you he's a statesman. So would a lot of other people, including Shonekon, whose government had been declared illegal by a court. He still goes to the National Council of State meeting. Every Nigerian that you see referred to as a statesman is a crook. Hmm. Simpliciter. It is actually, when you use words in Nigeria, be careful to, to look at the root. They will call a Babangida a statesman, for instance. They will call an Abdusalami a statesman. They are all statesmen, and the only thing that distinguishes them from the rest of us is the impunity by which they had governed and by which they had stolen all of us blind and ruined the country. So when you use the word statesmen in the Nigerian context, or people use words, we use so many words in Nigeria that do not mean what they are meant to mean. And I'm not, I'm actually always very happy to be disagreed with. The beauty is that I would think before I open my mouth, even though I might speak categorically to some facts. And when I do, it is intended to provoke. If what I have said is wrong, or if it is a lie, then I challenge the other person to come up with the counter argument or the facts that I have in some way contravened by stating the position I have taken, which they might be unhappy with. If for instance, I say that everyone who has ruled Nigeria is a chief, it's a matter of fact. It's not just an opinion. That is the way it is. The state rules and is governed by impunity. So let's call it what it is. We're 61 years old. If this were to be a true human being at 61, if God forbid that a parent should bet something like Nigeria at 61, what has he achieved? Absolutely. Something you really said uh, earlier uh, resonated with that. Uh, and that has to do with this north-south uh, oh. contraction. Um, could, could you clarify? See, 
One of the biggest lies in Nigerian history is the presumption of a monolithic northern Nigeria. So when you hear someone sit in Arewa House in Kaduna and presumes to speak for the North, the question you need to ask is this. The North for whom he presumes to speak, does it have space for the Jukun man? Is the TV man part of that North? The man in Nasarawa that is neither Fulani, does that, is that person a part of that North? So when they're talking about the North, and they're talking even as far as the northeast, even the northeast, the northwest, the people of Kankara, whose children abducted. were abducted, are they part of that north? Because these questions need to be asked. Those people busy killing each other in just in the on the plateau, are they part of that north? These are questions that need to be asked. Those children in the Islamia school in Niger State. Are they part of that north? The people who were killed in Niger State, I think that just a couple of days back, are they part of that north? Exactly what does that north represent? So when people stand up and speak blithely to a north-south divide, what I say is that you are actually helping the evil winners of Nigeria to magnify the divisions that they had always worked on to ensure that they are preserved in power. The Nigerian reigning class, whether that be the Yoruba members of that class, or the Igbo members, or the Jaw members, or is Ponde, is, is Ponde a full animal? Is Apabio a full animal? Is Tinubu a full animal? Is Fashola a full animal? Is any one of them, outside of this, the token Fulani who are sat there in the strategic security architecture of this country. How many of them are Fulanis? The people ruining Nigeria comes from all across Nigeria. So when they talk about the north-south divide, you must understand that this is merely a smokescreen behind which a whole lot of people are hiding. If it's truly about a north-south divide, then there shouldn't be any problem between IPOB and the, and the southeast governors. There should be no division between what the man in the creek in the Niger Delta wants and what Okoa and the, all, the governors of Rivers and Bayelsa. What they want should not be different from what the person in the creek wants. But the reality is that there is a vast difference between what you hear in rhetorics and the reality on the ground. They might, when it suits them to speak to a north-south divide, you find southern governors playing up secessionist sentiments merely as a negotiation stratagem. You find people actively encouraging secessionist arguments when they, in their actions, actually stifle the right to self-determination. So when people talk about the north-south divide, it will be fraudulent of me to suggest that some people have not hidden behind this to advance their own class interest. But as a people, the Nigerian poor do not care where the person bearing their food is coming from. Adamu and Emeka are busy trading, living together. They quarrel, yeah, but they make up. But those who divide them and gain from dividing them, do business together on a steady. Steady. They don't quarrel. When you hear their quarrels, they're quarreling over how to share the loot. But the victims are busy taking sides in a quarrel between crooks who are merely quarreling about how to share the very clothes you are wearing on your back. So, this north-south divide thing, we need to be very careful about how we look at it. The Nigerian ruining class will be very happy if Nigeria should collapse around the weight of its hypocrisy, because it then means that they can get away with all they have stolen. The average local government councillor has alternative citizenship. He's bought citizenship of one canary, one island in the Mediterranean, just like Jezani merely pointed the way to a whole lot of them. 
they all have alternative citizenship. Anything happens in Nigeria tomorrow, they're gone. And it is the only way they guarantee that they escape with their loot. If people are not sure that they would escape with their loot, how could what has been happening in the National Assembly be happening? Think about it. Under the full glare of the cameras, you could hear the chairman of the mic, of the mic. If they off the mic, they off our heights. Have you heard anybody talk about it since that time? Be see, they are happy if we are stupid enough to start killing ourselves on the basis of a north-south divide. The person who was speaking, he was from the Niger Delta, Apabio. The person offering the mic, he said, Yoruba man, sat in that committee will be people also from the Niger Delta. There is a, there is a pan-Nigerian crash. They don't care about religion. Their ethnicity also does not matter. It's a crass thing. That class that you call the ruling class, that class does not care where you come from. It's an advantage if you could speak Fufu Day as far as Buhari is concerned. That might accelerate your progress in the ranks. But if you are, Yor if you are Yoruba and you are Muslim, you also get some protection. So let's be clear, this has nothing to do with a geographical line. It might be an ideological north, which will be the north that you speak to when you talk about the feudalization of Nigeria. But really, beyond an ideological north, there's really no north that you can speak to as one monolithic entity. Let me get to your perspective on this uh Sometimes, uh, some couple of days back, you started this hashtag here, the Kure. <laughs> some will uh, refer to you as the Nostradamus of Nigeria when you predicted the dictatorial tendencies of uh, this uh, president, President uh, General Muhammad Buhari, retired. Uh, I remember two years ago, you stated that you, you will have called him out. Let me read your exact words. I do not believe his incompetence to be in doubt. His nepotism is legendary and his disdain for the rule of law is well advertised. This was exactly two years. How do you feel that this has actually come to pass? Look, <laughs> I'm sorry to say this, but you haven't been paying attention. If you go back to the essay that titled my first book, Do Not Die in Their War, hmm. go back to that essay. It was published, I believe, on the 7th of February, 2015 in Guardian. Guardian was so scared shitless, they ensured that they put my picture on the piece. Even though I never sent them my picture, they were probably too scared because so many other publications would not even carry it. But here it was, there is something I said in that piece, clearly. I said with worry, nothing will change. That the war against corruption had been lost before it started. This was before it was elected. I said the same Nigerian army will remain as castrated as it was at that time before his election. I said that the same governors and the godfathers will remain so under him. In fact, if anything, he has surpassed my worst expectations of him. So that I said this two years ago, that has nothing to do with anything. This was merely, I, there is nothing I have said about Buari that he has failed to do. Buari is the most predictable president Nigeria has had. He's very simple in his idiocy. He does not, but he's a very simple-minded man. I want full and ease in all the offices. He doesn't think consequences, how people will think about it, how they will react, what your emotional boss might be. Because he understands the system. He knows that the South Easterners who will make noise publicly, they are coming prostrating later in the day. The Yorubas who make noise publicly, they are going to phone him later in the day and they'll come prostrating. So he knows the system. He knows, he's a man who understands the use of power. The, he has a natural affinity for impunity. And he has surrounded himself with enablers, not people who tell him what to do, the right thing to do. There are people who say, yes, sir. Who is going to tell him what to do in that cabinet? Look around. Is it Malami who is barely literate when it comes to law, who will make pronouncements in aid of tyranny, variously, Twitter ban, 
interpreting the constitution as though he were to be in king. Name it. Who is going to tell him the truth in that cabinet? Everybody is busy. It's like a boy. It's like a cabinet. When you when you have a ship that is sinking, it's the rats that first start jumping. Look at that cabinet. Who in that cabinet is going to tell him the truth? One of the most brilliant human beings I ever came across in my life is Professor Yemi Oshibaju. That if Professor Oshibaju is in that government and these kind of things are happening, it should tell you sufficiently. Look, oh, I forgot. <laughs> the man has bad hearing. So it's probably, it's actually possible that they are telling him and he's not listening. But it's just the way it is. He's not listening to anyone. So that I said that two years ago is nothing. Go back to the beginning. Buhari is a tragedy foretold, but it's not about Buhari, it's about the system that produced him and it will produce worse. Buhari at least is not too intelligent, he says it, he doesn't use trickery. He's is very, is very direct. The people like El Rufai, let them come into power, or somebody like Fashola, let them come into power, you know what it means to have intelligent evil people in power.